This is the Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo, giving you the inside track on all the big talking points from Anfield. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red channel. I'm Josh Williams and I'm joined by Mo Stewart. Mo, how are you getting on, mate? I'm good, man. I'm good. I've got to say, um, the the return of European football always puts me in a good mood, even though obviously it feels slightly different this year with us having not played in the Champions League. But I am still in a good mood. I think we've still got a good team and reasons to be positive. Well, that feels relevant, to be fair, because we are recording today on a Wednesday and I assume this will be the case moving forward, really, considering Liverpool are now playing on Thursday nights doesn't make much sense to record on the day of a game and then it might potentially be outdated by the time the game is played. So, yeah, we're recording on a Wednesday this week. Probably going to continue that way. Um, And we will touch on the Europa League, I think, a little bit at at some point in the pod today. Uh, But first off, uh, Liverpool won another game. Uh, I think we're on 13 points at the minute. Uh, Two behind City at the top. Um, What are your thoughts, mate? Well, when we when the final whistle blew, we were top of the league for the first time yeah. in 16 months, which I know means absolutely nothing after five games, but it does actually, I think, mean a little bit of something. It's kind of like a little bit of a mark to say, okay, we look like we're on the right track. I mean, we're not kind of making any conclusions yet, but it looks like we're on the right track. We're allowing other teams to fear us again. And obviously the way this game went... Um, if you look at past last season, it would have gone a very different way. There would have been a very different result after the first 20, 25 minutes of that football game. And the fact that there wasn't and that Liverpool were able to, again, drag themselves out from a sluggish start, start to play their football, start to enforce their will on the game and then use their deadly weapons up front to go and win it. Doing that again will build more confidence to be able to go into the next games. Yeah, well, it was an absolute cliche game of two halves, <laughs> weren't it? Like you couldn't possibly have had it more that way. Um, and I think I think you're right in touching on the the mentality of the team. I think that definitely seems to have recovered a little bit. And to be honest, I've never overly felt that that was um, the the thing. Like last season, I don't think we suddenly fell off a cliff regarding just turned into a, a gang of pushovers. I, I think it was just more a case of we just lost the ability of of a team, especially in, in the midfield department, to dominate games and to create those wave after wave of attack to get back in a game, potentially. And I think now um, it looks like the mentality is back and things like that. It looks like we're able to, to come from behind again and things, and we are. But I just think generally as well, we just look like a better team, a better group of individuals now more of a midfield department as well. Um, and if we do need to kind of dominate a game in search of a goal, we now have more of a platform to do that now that we've kind of got rid of, well, basically five midfielders in one summer and we've got four new lads coming in, some of whom look really, really good. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think part of why that mentality has changed, and you're right, I think that, there were mitigating circumstances for why it kind of appeared to go away last season. But it's trust and belief in the ability within the team. I think everybody in that team could see just as well as we could that the midfield wasn't doing what it should be or what it could be. And you do start to feel differently about your own team. You think, well, we can't really do that anymore. Now they look like they believe that they can do those things, even when initially things aren't going their way. And you're right, it's the influx of new talent definitely helped that. New skill sets, new energy. But also, I think just the ability, Jürgen Klopp's been very smart in his whole kind of year one kind of narrative because it allows you to kind of clean the slate from the ills of last season. Say, okay, last season was what it was, but we are still who we are and we can go out and prove it here. Yeah, I think... um... Sadly, we do have to touch on the first half, though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I think I think it's important. I really do. It's very important, yeah, because we learned, in my opinion, a massive lesson. Yes. Because what we did was we played our first game using the 3-2-5 shape, if you want, um, without Trent in the team. 
Uh, Trent has played every single game since April when it was first introduced as a new thing. Um, and Liverpool are unbeaten, still unbeaten. But that first half, and it wasn't just because of the shape, because mm. there was a few lads in there who were just genu- generally shattered. But he opted to play Joe Gomez in Trent's place. And rather than just playing him as a standard limited fullback, which I thought he would do, and Gomez starts. Half, by the way. <laughs> Say it again. And he did it in the second half, by the way. Yeah. Well, Gomez started to drift inside and play as a inverted fullback. Um, additional presence in the centre alongside Alexis McAllister. And uh, I don't think it worked, to be honest. Um, and it kind of captured like the, the uniqueness of Trent. Not that we needed to know that anyway. But in my opinion, now on the back of this game, I think it's pretty obvious, pretty clear that if Trent isn't playing, you just can't really play the box unless you're a really dominant favourite to win the game. Like, say, for example, you're going up against, I don't know, Luton or someone like that, or maybe to lose in Europa League or something. But for the most part, when Trent isn't playing, I don't think you can play like that. No, and I mean, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall next to Joe Gomez when um, Klopp told him that plan. (laughs) If you'd be like, Really? Really? <laughs> like, wow, I'm, I'm flattered that you think I can do that, but but really? Um, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's difficult because, like you say, we've been playing that way for so long. It almost felt like in situations where there might be vulnerability, such as after a break, you want to try and stay with as much of what's good, as much as what works or has been working, and with the knowledge that there was always going to be a makeshift back four, maybe Jurgen was thinking, okay, I want to keep everything else as similar as possible. But there were obviously flaws in that in as much as Gomez. Ironically enough, I don't think the passing element of it was an issue because I do think he did play some decent balls when he was in that area. I think the problem for him, again, we go back to belief. I'm not sure he had the trust and the belief to play that position. And the thing I always say with Joe, and this is true of Joel Matip as well, there's very rarely a six out of ten game. It's normally a seven, eight, nine, ten, or three or four. Yeah. And that first time, and part of it is down to indecision. When he looks bad, he looks like he doesn't know what he's doing. He's he's kind of a bit flustered. He's always a little bit unsure of himself, maybe second guessing every single decision. You see that in him in his body language on the pitch when he's not playing well. And I feel like asking him to do this kind of brought some of that on because he wasn't. I, he wasn't coming inside every single time. And it, as we see with Trent, there is certain triggers where he does drift in when certain teams, opponents have got the ball in certain areas or when we've got the ball in certain areas. And he didn't feel like he was used to that and it caused a bit of indecision. What didn't help is that that plus play in that box also played exactly into Wolves' game plan because Wolves' game plan was not to play through the middle, it was to play balls diagonal to their wide players, to keep that pitch, that massive Molyneux pitch, as wide as possible and attacking behind. And if you've got Gomez coming inside and you're asking Joel Matip, who has a decent top speed, but is not really what you call quick, and you're asking him to try and cover across behind Gomez, who's coming inside, that's a lot of problems. And as it turned out, Pedro Neto, particularly in that first half, was ruthless. I think he... Completed 10 out of 10 passes, three out of three dribbles, got the ball 17 times and just made everybody look stupid. And so it was a com- com- accumulation of all of those things, which I think that led to us looking so shaky. You have to kind of factor in as well the fact that midfield guys did not start well. We weren't able to pass the ball. And so then you get a situation where when the defenders do have the ball, they don't feel confident to be able to pass it into midfield. Maybe they don't feel confident enough to play out wide. You've got Jota and Gakpo constantly coming towards the ball, not stretching the play. And it just becomes a malaise. Yeah, it was it was a bad half. Um, I think I felt particularly sorry for Alexis McAllister. Um, he did his best, but he was shattered, mate. <laughs> yeah. Like, it was, it, was, it was half eight in the morning, according to his body clock. Um, and he just flew 6,000 miles home. Um you know, on a on a flight. To be fair to him, he didn't actually have to fly using <laughs> like that. But <laughs> uh, I think he was just knackered, and you could tell that based on his performance. Because I think one of his biggest perks, McAllister, is his decision making. 
Yes. And if you're tired, that is one of the obvious departments that drops a little bit. Uh, he got an early yellow card and things like that. So I felt sorry for him. Same with Gomez. You know, I, I think Gomez is kind of rebuilding himself a little bit at the minute. And Klopp presented them with a role that really didn't get the most out of him and made them look bad. Um, even worse than he, he actually is, really. Um, you mentioned Pedro Neto there. I think that's worth mentioning again, simply because he did feature on the show last week. Um, he is definitely one to watch, and I think more so now that I've seen him against Liverpool. Because <laughs> um, he, he's still, I think he's only 23 still, I think I remember yeah. saying. Um, he is re- represented by, by George Mendes' agency, I think, and Liverpool tends to do business with them a fair bit. He's created the most chances in the Premier League so far this season. He's only playing for Wolves. Yeah. Really keen dribbler, difficult to stop, very fast. Uh, joint most assists in the Premier League this season so far with Mo Salah. So, and we've touched on the fact that, okay, he might not be that much of a scorer, but we did touch last week on on the new dynamic at Liverpool at the minute and and, and that kind of, those wide players don't have to be golden boots obsessed anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was a good audition for Neto, to be honest. He was quiet in the second half, but I think that stemmed from how Liverpool changed the game tactically. It did. Yeah, we, our, our changes worked really well, but I think it's interesting as well when you say that he's got the most chance to create it still the most assists. And then you think about the Wolves forward line at the moment. Uh, Sasha Kalajic probably will start to come good eventually. Um, but when you look at the chance that Cunha missed, I think you think about some of the chances yeah. the Wolves have missed over the last three seasons. And yet he's still getting loads of assists. That tells you how dangerous he really is. You mentioned how we, we stopped him. Second half, as I say, he got 17 touches of the ball first half, seven in the second half. And we were playing wider. That was basically what it was. That gap that he had to run into was closed by not having Gomez, but we were generally having someone, uh, a midfield or forward over on the right side as well, whether it was Elliot when he came on or sometimes even Salah and sometimes even Soboslai when he was feeling a little bit fruity. But we generally had someone over there in that space ready to close it down. So that meant that Gomez could feel a little bit more confident, maybe being a bit more front foot when the ball came towards him in that area because he knew that he had someone else able in, the, in close vicinity. Yeah, I'm just checking now. Does he take set pieces for Wolves? I think he does, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I think he's, so he's benefiting from a few of them, to be fair to him, in terms of chances created. But so far, he's assisted 17 shots in the Premier League this season. Uh, Julian Alvarez is second with Bruno Fernandes and Pascal Gross. They're all on 16. And then Bukayo Saka on 15. So it's a good start for the season for him, even if he has taken set pieces. And um, he is definitely one to watch. But yeah, in terms of how Liverpool kind of tackled its second half, I expected more subs at half time. I thought it was that bad. And uh, yeah. I expected, to be honest, I expected Endo to come in. Just as a, do you remember when Liverpool were losing the Champions League final 3 0 and the subs that she, that Rafa made was Diddy a man? You know, I felt yeah. like it was going to be along them lines, to be honest. But Klopp, being typical Klopp, kind of went, went, went for it and uh, <laughs> took off McAllister in favour of Luis Diaz and, and completely changed the formation, ditched the box and went towards a 4 4 2. And as you say, Wolves for the first half. Defended really, really narrow, which caused a problem for Liverpool's box and attacked really, really wide. Yeah. So in the second half, Liverpool then adopted 4 4 2, which is a pretty wide formation. Um, we could pin their wide players back using our full backs at times. Um, and we weren't attacking as narrow, so that caused them problems. Uh, I thought Soboslai really recovered in the second half as well. I think in the first half, it was. It's it's you, you know it's bad when your top player just seems completely off it like yeah. out of nowhere just giving the ball away simple five yard passes that's when it's bad, but in the second half I felt he kind of assumed the role of Trent, as in like Liverpool's kind of mm. dictated a little bit. Uh, he was spreading the play, st- stood on the centre circle for the most part. Yeah. Um. It was again it was a bold move. I I tweeted in the second half saying like I think I tweeted a picture of Dean Smith. Yeah. <laughs> And he's looking on the pitch with his eyes squinting. <laughs> I, I said, like, that that was me looking for Liverpool's holding midfield. They're looking for who on earth Klopp is told to stay behind the ball. But to be fair to him, it worked. 
it did work. I mean, I think to a certain extent, we have to give the manager a bit of credit. I was critical when it was happening in the first half because it felt like we weren't expecting Wolves to have a fast start. Maybe we were thinking they were out of confidence in terms of where they were playing, but they've se- they would have seen fast starts trouble Liverpool all season long. So they should have expected them to have a fast start, and yet they didn't. And then from there, you think maybe Klopp's thinking, well, okay, once they do have a fast start, they're not going to be able to maintain it. And I've still got lots of weapons from the bench. So you can see that being the plan. But obviously, we have to lean into the fact that this season, attack is the best form of defence. Our attack is our greatest strength at the moment and the depth of it, as well as the variety. So it, it kind of goes to show that we're going to use that as our greatest weapon. I think there was a bit of a tale the last few minutes of the first half. The first time that Jota really did try and stretch the play out wide, we got the ball out there and we got those flurry of chances just before half time. So when the Klopp saw that and thought, right, this is what we need. We need players to stretch the play. So you have Diaz who can do that, but also can cause problems when he drifts in wide. But in terms of Endo, I can see why you, I, most people would have thought he'd come on. I kind of wouldn't have been surprised if he'd come on because... Yes, he played for Japan, but he only played 25 minutes in their last game. So he would have been relatively fresh. He stayed in the, he stayed in Europe as well. Exactly. And I just think Klopp is still very much trying to protect certain people, try and get them up to speed, whether tactically or physically. I think the same with Stefan Bajsetic, because, I mean, he was someone else who's been on the bench a lot and not got on. I do think we're trying to be as ultra careful as possible with him, which to me kind of makes sense. And I also think that Klopp sees the mentality of the guys he's got in midfield. I'm thinking of Soboslai in particular, but also Curtis Jones, because they were a partnership in that central midfield. I yeah. feel like Klopp sees them as kind of guys who want to be like, if I give you a job, maybe even as a job that other people think you can't do, but you think you can do, then they're really going to get the bit between their teeth. And that's exactly what happened in that second half, because they were very much playing almost like, uh, it was if it was a four two three one, they'd be the double pivot. But as I say, it kind of drifted between that and four four two, and they were able to dominate that midfield. Wolves couldn't play through them, as they as we said, they we cut off their diagonal angle, so they had to play through them, and they couldn't. They bigger having to retreat deeper and deeper because of the threat in behind of Diaz and Nunes and Salah, and so it was just, they couldn't get out. So we were able to just pen them in for long periods, gain that control. And that's what, and even though the goals didn't come late, I never really felt like the goals weren't going to come. Well, Gary O'Neill said after the game, you know, in his, in his analysis, that like Liverpool, I think he mentioned a few times that Liverpool were able to bring on Diaz and Nunes. And I think um, just after the thoughts of that strikes fear into the typical, you know, inferior opposition who are competing maybe near the bottom of the Premier League, it, it, it is scary when you're bringing on them players. and if you think of the best teams in Premier League history, that, that that's always been the thing. If you think of Ferguson's Man United, you know, he, he could just bring on, he could just take off his two forwards, two strikers, and bring on another two strikers, and they'd completely change the game for him, usually. Uh, obviously, City have always had depth, and Liverpool have got it now in attacking areas, so that bodes well for us moving forward. Um, yes. I will be honest, though, I think, I mean, I'm trying not to get not to focus on the game too much because it it felt like a a bit of a different kind of game in the sense that Mm -hmm. a lot of the team had been away on international duty. Um, Some of the players had been all the way in South America and that it was an early kick-off um, and Trent wasn't playing and Canate wasn't playing and Virgil wasn't playing. So I don't think we can take too much from it. But I wanted to see more of the Villa game because I felt really good after the Villa game in terms of this team can compete for the title because we we really got the balance right with attacking and controlling the game. This felt like another, it felt like a step back and I was like, honest to God, I, I, I want to believe in this team as, as a title winner. I just, I, can't, I, just, I can't yet. I, I, just, I just don't think that the circumstances were similar enough to be able to say that they were going to be able to do that. I don't, I think... Yeah, I agree. Well, all of those players you mentioned, but also... The fact that they're at home against Villa, that does help. 
It really does help. You think about, I, I've already mentioned the Molly News and Massive Pitch, and it's something I feel like I always mention whenever we play Wolves because I think it really does change the tacticals. But think about last season when we went there, got absolutely pumped 3 0, and one of the worst performances we've had. Like those kind of things come into it as well. So Wolves would have come into the game with a decent plan. And again, like I say, whereas against Aston Villa, we were able to get in amongst them, really use our press well. Like, I believe Cody Gakpo in his first in the first half had 10 pressures, which is low for him. But that's because there was never a guy in front of him with the ball because <laughs> the ball was going that way and that way. So it, it was kind of negating some of the things that we wanted to do. Was, I mean, obviously, Gary O'Neill spent time at Liverpool with the youth team, but he's a very smart man. And he clearly knew some of the things that he would be able to use to help hurt us. I think he also knew, though, that he wouldn't be able to do it for the whole game, which is why post-match they he was concentrating heavily on that Cunha chance. Because with all of what we've said about how well Liverpool did to turn it around, if it's 2-0, it's a very, very different game. And let's face it, it should have been 2-0. Like, he should have scored that chance. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's that's kind of why... I think it was a, it was a big win, you know. It was the kind of title-winning three-pointer, to be honest, in terms of just finding a way to get over the line and early kick-off, bit of a scruffy game, few key players absent. So it bodes well in that sense. I am just in a position where I, I, I'm I, eager to see Liverpool control a few games in a row and, mm. and, and win them without really having any kind of coin flip involved. And I think West Ham coming up this weekend will be an interesting one because I think out of possibly the large majority of the teams in the Premier League, I think they pose one of the biggest threats mm. and challenges when it comes to can you control us you know because they, they, they will focus on the break they will focus on the counter attack for the whole 90 minutes and they're perfectly satisfied doing that um so they kind of present the challenge of if you slip up if you make any kind of mistake we are rising in on you a bit like liverpool to be honest a few years back yeah, yeah. um so whether we can, I think if if Canard takes back Virgil, Trent, whatever, you know, it'll be interesting to see. McAllister's had a good night's kip. Yeah, <laughs> um, it'll be, be interesting to <laughs> it'll be interesting to see how we cope in that game. And I think if if it's any, anything like the Villa game, then again, I will feel a lot more confidence again. But um, I, I mean, in general, I agree with you. I think there is an issue within this, though. I do think that over the course of the Premier League season, we are going to see that kind of control that we crave is harder than ever to achieve because teams are now more used to playing against it because it's not just us who play that way. You've got Manchester City, you've got Arsenal who tried to play that way as well. But also, uh, everyone's got a threat. I mean, we were talking about Wolves being in the bottom five and then, then Pedro Neto being a player who's good enough to play for Liverpool. Like, most teams have got at least one or two guys we like, okay, we need to keep an eye on him. So being able to smother and control the game as easily as we have in the past, I don't think it's going to be easy, particularly against West Ham. Because, I mean, they were 1-0 up after, uh, what, 55 minutes against City last week and looking good. And then City equalised. And then West Ham still had chances to retake the lead. It wasn't a case of City got their goal and then just steamrolled them. They were still a threat throughout. So West Ham are going to be very tough. And I think when you're playing your team like the way they are, the playing away from home isn't going to phase them. I think it's going to help with some parts of their game plan. But from Liverpool's point of view, it might not necessarily be that we're able to gain the control that we were able to against Aston Villa. It might be that we just have to make sure that we are clinical in our moments. I want to believe that that's possible. I just think that we are still very early in this evolution and development. So we might have to kind of wear these for a little bit. Yeah, well, I think the crucial thing is, even though the performances so far, so far haven't entirely been there in terms of that dominance and that, you know, taking care of the performance to such an extent that the result just follows suit, we have picked up the results still. You know, we, we have only dropped, I think, two points all season so far. Um, so very much on track, and I think it's impossible. I think it's important to... To kind of get that momentum going behind you and, and establish yourself very early as 
you know, what you intend on doing for the rest of the season. And so far, it's very clear that there's, for me, certainly like a distinct top four, potentially top five. And it's nice that Man United and Chelsea aren't a part of it either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just a, a final note on, on the Wolves game, just a quick word on, on Gerald Kwanzaa. Uh, mm. He did play there, well, the large majority of the game at least. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? A very mature performance, once again, from a guy who looks like at least emotionally he's ready to play games at this level. I think there's obviously going to be times where maybe it doesn't go for him as well, but I think decisions that he made under pressure time and time again made me think that, yeah, we've got a real player here. And it wasn't easy for him because when you think about the circumstances he came into, uh, in terms of what we've already mentioned about Gomez to the right of him and McAllister in front of him, I, I really felt like there was never a moment where Wolves were getting at him or where it felt like we had a guy playing his first start in the team. It never felt like that to me. And I think that's the biggest compliment I can give him. Yeah, I think for me, the the, the big thing when it comes to these, these youngsters getting games in, games that they very really shouldn't be starting in, the, the big thing that you're after really is does the kid stand out? And 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 ideally, you just want them to blend in completely and, and look. Like, say, for example, if someone was watching the game who'd never watched Liverpool before, if they can pick out who the kid is, you've got a problem. Yeah. But I think he kind of just blended in as another, you know, first teamer, really. I don't think he stood out as he's the one who's learning on the job. He's the one who's getting his Premier League debut, essentially. And I think that's the most you can ask for, really. But it's, I think it's too early for me to kind of judge maybe what he's going to become or even his level or anything like that. I think it's difficult to tell at the moment. But so far, he's certainly got the physical edge to his game and he looks composed, cool and things like that. Um, but, you know, it means to be seen well, we'll see more of him, uh, possibly in the Europa League and things like that. Um, but what, one final little um, kind of narrative that's emerged is Salah the creator. Uh, mm-hmm. he, got, he got a hat-trick of assists almost. Um Four assists now for the Premier League season so far. Seven assists in pre-season. Um, are we experiencing a change here? Um, may- <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I mean, I d- I don't, I'd have to look really deep into his chance creation numbers because I feel like maybe he's just in a situation now where Liverpool is creating chances in better situations where Liverpool are more likely to score. But then... But then you think about the ball he played for Andy Robertson. Not everybody can play that ball. The perfect weight, perfect mm. timing. Just allow him to just run onto it and slot it. So obviously, there's a part of him that wants to prove that he's a great all-round player and that he can do all these things. I I also think it helps that we've got so many other great forwards. So when you've got people who are likely to score when you give them good chances, then your, your assists are going to rise. Do I think that this means that he doesn't care about scoring goals? Absolutely not. <laughs> he still very much wants to score goals. He is still Mo Salah. But he's taking joy in getting other people involved. And that is very, very important because we've already seen what can happen when some of the players who were the cornerstones of previous teams are suddenly, well, I don't want to say not as important because Salah is still important, but the team changes to prioritise other people, put it that way. And some players don't take that well. Some players haven't taken that well. Some players have taken themselves off other places because they didn't want to deal with that. Salah has embraced it. And it's for the great, the betterment of everybody, for his, his teammates and for himself. So I'm here for it. And long may it continue. Yeah, I think it's very early to be moving on this, but it is um, it is an interesting one to keep an eye on because it, historically, since he came to Anfield, Salah's been the tip of the spear for Liverpool. He's been the highest player, the player who runs in behind, the player who finishes the move, the player who finds the net, all that stuff. With Sadio Mane, with Firmino facilitating that, that was the original tactical dynamic in the final third. I think now... It's a little bit different in the sense that when Nunes is playing in particular, Nunes is the tip of the spear and Salah's feeding Nunes running in behind, which is very different. We've now got offensive mind and number eight as well on the team. 
Salah's maybe getting instructed to stay a little bit wider because of the nature of the system that we're playing now. So I think he will always score goals, obviously. But I think um, it's in the system once to keep an eye on in terms of just how much of a creative source he becomes. Um, and maybe if he goes back in time almost towards what he was for Roma, where he had Ed and Jeho up front, Jeho scored more goals than Salah. Salah got a good amount of goals, but a, a good amount of assists too, and it was kind of a bit of a balance there between the two of them. Um, I did have a look at this with Redman TV this week uh, on, on YouTube, uh, but in terms of his numbers, he's currently posting, I mean, again, it's extremely early. I shouldn't even be referencing these numbers, to be honest. But in terms of shots per 90, he's currently posting his fewest in the Premier League yeah. ever. And in terms of chances created per 90, he's currently posting his most ever in the Premier League. So it's very early, but it's yeah. interesting to, to keep and an eye on. Stats are just a guide. That's all they are. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like in that one, it really does kind of lay out to you the difference. Yeah. I'd imagine at the team total of shots, it's probably stay consistent as well. And that's the point, is that the team isn't suffering from him shooting less. And yeah. I think that's really important. The other thing you put into it as well, I think we talk about it from the kind of unselfish manner for self Salah, but there is some selfish element as well because he loved having Sadio Mane there because he knew the teams had to honour him as a threat. I think one, one thing that Salah really wants to avoid at any point in his Liverpool career is him being the only guy that anyone thinks is going to score because then he, the wall of three defenders if he gets every time he gets the ball is going to continue. And he hates that wall. He wants to get rid of it. And the best way to get rid of it is to make the, some of those defenders have to mark that other guy. Well, what I think is interesting is if you look at his output in terms of expected goals and expected assists, um, his expected goals so far this season, again, it's, it's too early for me to be saying this, but his expected goals so far this season, excluding penalties, is down compared to previous seasons. It's never been as low as it is right now for Liverpool. His expected assists has never been as high as it is right now for Liverpool, by some distance as well. Mm. And if you combine those as to, to like determine a player's attack and output, so that's expected goals plus expected assists, yeah. he's actually more, he's actually higher right now so far this season than ever before. So we're still getting just as much output from attacking-wise. Yeah. It's just in terms of like a scales thing, there's been a bit more weight maybe placed on the creative side than the scoring side. But it's mm -hmm. still, he's still extremely threatening if you see what I'm getting at. Yeah. And, and again, like you say, because it's still early, there, there might not necessarily be this way for the whole season. It might be, like I say, that this begats teams playing him differently, which gives him more goal scoring opportunities. He's still an intelligent enough player to know when to play the ball and when to take the shot on. I think it's funny because traditionally, Mo Salah at Liverpool has always been accused of being greedy by certain people because there'll be the one shot in a game that it looks like someone else is in a better position, but he'll take it on. And everyone, oh, he's so greedy. And obviously there was the whole him and Mane business. But I do think when it comes to the crunch over the course of a 90-minute game, he makes the right decision more often than not and more often than most. So... You can say that, yes, he has a greedy, selfish streak, but that's the same greedy, selfish streak that literally every single top striker ever has. And he's able to get around that to share his his, his wealth with other uh, opponents for the betterment of the team, as I was saying. Yeah, I think that's, that's the crucial thing, is his any selfishness that is attached to him, it has always benefited the team. It, it's never been any kind of a problem, apart from that one away game against Burnley, maybe. <laughs> when, when I, don't, I don't know. Like, obviously, history has maybe painted that in different contexts when we've seen some of the other incidents involving Sadio. Maybe he was just having a bad day that day. Yeah, yeah. that was... Uh, I mean, I have to understand Sadio Mane's concerns that day, to be fair. I think he did deserve a few passes, but uh, it's not often Salo has a game like that. Um, we do also have a new contract in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Doak uh, has been signed, has been given a new deal uh, just 12 months after arriving from Celtic. 
probably we will see him in the Europa League on Thursday night. Um, but good news, Mo. Very good news. I think it's one of those where it's not a case of anything other than Liverpool rewarding the player for the last 12 months and saying, well done. We think that you deserve it. Obviously, I dare say there's a semi-significant pay rise. I think for a player of 17, the, the numbers that we're going to be dealing with are always going to be significant or feel significant. But it's to say, yes, you are definitely part of the, the first team squad now. Obviously, I think he was playing first team football at Celtic before we got in. So he was probably of the opinion that it wouldn't take him long to break in, even at a club like Liverpool. But what we've seen is that he has earned his place within the squad. And I think over the course of the next year, it's going to be exciting to see how we develop him, where he comes in, and maybe how we get him, where, where his permanent place within the squad lies in terms of options for certain games, maybe starts for certain games. Yeah, really interesting player. And still somehow only 17, which is really interesting. But I think he's at the age at the minute for me where if you, it's it's a case of you just have to let him do what he's good at. And I think if you watch him, it's quite obvious that his best quality and his, the quality he's most eager to showcase is his dribbling ability. 1v1, directness, sheer pace, um, that sort of thing. And I, I think what's interesting about that is Liverpool's current system, you know, the box shape technically allows for the the wide players especially the wide right to, to to do that because if trent tucks inside for example and brings a midfielder with him that opens up and pass a passing lane to salah usually and then salah gets the ball and and, and whatever but i think if if salah needs a rest every now and then doke isn't left footed but if you was to play doke over there and every time you was to receive to receive the ball klopp just said to him go at your man Every mm. single time, just go at your man. Last week, I watched um, City against West Ham, and Jeremy Doku, I think, played his Premier League debut, and he literally just did that for 90 minutes, mate. Yep. He, he scored, to be fair to him. Yes. But aside from the goal, the, the 1v1 facing up that he did all game, just kept relentlessly running at his opposite man. Um, it's, it's a very... It, it's the kind of system that allows dribblers to shine if you let them. And I think Doku has the skills now to be a real problem if he faces up any opponent really 1v1 uh, definitely and i think the, th the funny thing about doku is is that it was running at his opponent that got him his goal he basically just ran yeah. him down into the box and then just passed it into the far corner now that's something the pass into the far corner is the, the probably the biggest thing that Doak has to add to his game but you're right i think it allows him to be uh so have a simplified version uh of just like yeah. see man beat man get into get ball into the box and the, obviously the thing with having a left foot on the right means that they can cut inside and shoot but i think his his pace his low center of gravity means that even if you always know he's going to go on the outside that doesn't mean you can stop him so yeah. i think that's going to be able to mitigate some of that and then once he's in those positions we're going to have players like Soberslai, like salah um maybe even a McAllister or a jones arriving late who are going to give him plenty of options with his firing across the six yard box or playing a cutback or maybe even a dink to the far post so once he kind of gets used to the rhythms of the different teammates what kind of balls they want we're going to really see an explosion in his output i think because you're right at the moment he's very dangerous he's the kind of player that if you're a tiring side playing liverpool and maybe you're you're got a draw or a win or maybe even just one goal behind and then you see him coming on, you just think, oh, no. Yeah. No, he's not this, lads. I can't deal with this. And that's what you want. You want players who make the opposition weep when they come onto the pitch. I think the beauty of it as well is he's still got that element of surprise about his game. Like, people don't actually know much about him yet in terms of opponents and things like that. So when he comes on and, you know, you're like a seasoned professional who, who's like 30 years old and you've been around the game for years, and then this kid is just... It's just absolutely putting you on a treadmill, mate. You know, it's it's an absolute nightmare for you. So you don't actually know what to expect with him at the minute. And I think, although he's not left-footed and he can't really offer that style of dynamic of cutting inside and finding the far corner, I think he is so fast that he, if he's deployed on the right, 
I can see him a lot getting to the byline. Um, you know, kind of between the six yard box and the edge of the penalty box, and then like a cutback or a dink towards the back post, maybe or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, I just hope that when when we use him this season, because you will get opportunities. I hope it's just a, a really basic approach for him, and he's just allowed to just. El Klopp just presents him with that platform of just all you have to do really is every time you get the ball, beat your man. Just just showcase your dribbling ability because that that's quite clearly his overwhelming quality at the minute. Um, I think another thing as well about us being good, an underrated thing about it, is it allows us the space and to do that. I think if you think about times when we've been bad or maybe had an injury crisis and we've had to throw players in. Uh, and they've had to basically sink or swim, I think, of maybe by Setic, but even someone like Cody Gakpo when he arrived. And the, the circumstances aren't great for them to show their best immediately. And they may, those two managed to battle through and get to it. Whereas for someone like Doak, you, 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 you want to give him the best. And now we can. We're a better team. We've got more depth. So we aren't having to compromise in what, games we give him we can schedule it so he gets the perfect opponents in the perfect system to really show his best yeah we do have a game this weekend as well against West Ham that we've already touched on a little bit but I think it's going to be an interesting one and I think there's there's a there's a weird narrative with this one in the sense that if you look at Jared Bowen uh, Edson Alvarez and Nea Fagued they are three players who who genuinely could have easily ended up at Liverpool in the past couple of seasons. Like, Bowen is, as we said last week, for me, kind of like a bit of a clone for Salah. He's a little bit maybe past it now, age-wise, to actually get that move to Liverpool. He's 26 at the minute. Um, Aguirre is a top defender, uh, and he's left-footed. Mm. And I think at the time that he moved to West Ham, Liverpool uh, were linked with him a little bit. And Alvarez has just moved from Ajax to... Um, West Ham as kind of like the Declan Rice replacement and he was talked about on this pod as a Fabinho replacement for whatever reason Liverpool didn't get him which we thought was quite interesting because he's he's 25 yeah. rather than getting him for like, I think West Ham only paid about 30 million for him or something like that yeah. we ended up getting obviously Endo in instead for like 16 million or something or whatever it was there were lots of teams that kind of went a long way in negotiation with Alvarez only to then fall away at the end. I don't know whether there was agent shenanigans or what, what was going on, but there were yeah. a few teams that looked at him a long time and then decided against it. Well, I know Borussia Dortmund's trying to shine him. I'm not sure what happened there with that one. But just watching the three of those players come up against Liverpool this weekend at Anfield, it's, mm. it'll be interesting to see how they get on because Liverpool... As I said, it's kind of been reported that we've had interest in all of them. Yeah. Um, but for whatever reason, we've passed up on those opportunities. I think we looked at Pakatar when he was at Leon as well. I, I seem to remember around the time that yeah. we were, that Genie was leaving and we were getting Tiago. He was another name in the mix. But I mean, they've all gone to, I mean, if you believe some, then you'll say James Will Prowse was a, a target for Liverpool as well. But <laughs> I'm not sure how true that was, really. Um, but yeah, they've all ended up going to West Ham. The thing I think people forget about West Ham in terms of their ability to attract some of those players who are good enough to maybe play higher. West Ham have been in Europe three years in a row now. That means something. It's not a case of they had yeah. one year, got into Europe, didn't do very well, and then kind of drifted away and got uh, broken up or picked off by the big teams. They've been able to build. The guy who did get picked off They've used him to restock the cabinet and now they feel like they're stronger. So if you're a player from another league looking to get into England, maybe you, you're not necessarily getting that much interest as you like from the top teams. You can still say, OK, well, West Ham is a good place for me to show my, what I can do in a good environment. The, the big teams will say, OK, well, maybe we will be able to go for this guy. Obviously, West Ham aren't thinking about it that way. They just want to have good players in the team. But... At the moment, it's working for them very well. And I still wonder how they're going to have survive the season with their forward options. But the answer might be coming against Liverpool because another fella who was looked at by lots of play teams and didn't end up going to any of them, Mohamed Kudus, hasn't mm -hmm. started a game for them yet. And I would not be surprised if Anfield was his first one. They have got a really talented squad, haven't they, when you look at it like that? 
I mean, some really good recruitment over the past few years, and it does seem to have coincided a little bit with David Moyes, um, who did showcase good recruitment at uh, Everton as well, and that's kind of been a consistent theme throughout his career. But <clears throat> you have just mentioned uh, James Ward Prowse. This can be the final point for the show, but we can't not mention set pieces in relation <laughs> to West Ham. I am slightly terrified, I'll be honest. They've got a team of giants and they've got the best <laughs> delivery of the ball in the Premier League, probably, or arguably. Um, Kurt Zuma is enormous. <laughs> yes, yes. Aguirre is good in the air. Michael Antonio, Suchek, Alvarez is a good height. Um, so I think I'm right in saying Virgil is back for Liverpool, which is enormous for us. Yes. It'll be really good if Canate is back as well. Um, but yeah, that we are definitely going to be tested. That, that to be honest, I'd, I'd go as far as saying if Liverpool can stop the counter attack and stop set pieces, we will win the game. I yeah. think it's as simple as that. They're the two overwhelming threats that That's West Ham really offer, but they're very, very good at both of them. They are, and it's not just a case of them having good players attacking the ball and good delivery. They are clever with their set pieces, not just the corners, but the free kicks as well. They're good at changing angles. They're good at showing you something that you're not used to seeing or not expecting to see. And they are always up in Allison's face. Like, Allison hates playing West Ham because they're always... I mean, Craig Dawson's not there anymore to give him the little digs in the ribs, but there'll be someone else doing it. And they always do do it. They put two or three men in and around him and the first few two or three corners... It's going to be a melee. The ref's going to have to get involved, separate a few people. But what it'll hopefully do is draw the concentration away from the, some of the defenders so they can then attack in other areas. So concentration is going to be paramount when you're dealing with those set pieces. So hopefully, yes, Virgil and Canate are back and we've got something like our full strength defence because we're going to need it. Um, I do think that we are getting bigger ourselves as a side. Yeah. I mean... Endo and McAllister aside, obviously. Um, but I, so I think that we are slightly better equipped to deal with it than we were previously. But we've still got to do it. And you've got to do it for 90 minutes as well. Because, as you say, the, the delivery is going to be good for, a, for, a, for, a, for a, however long he's on the pitch, which will probably be the whole 95 minutes. Yeah, it's going to be a tricky one. Proper banana skin fixture, I think. Um so it's going to be interesting to watch that and see how Liverpool cope if we can get back to controlling the game, if hopefully Trent can play and things like that. But I want to keep an eye on. Mo, thanks for joining us, mate. No problem. It's been fun as always. And we'll be back next week. So thanks for tuning in and we will see you then. You've been listening to the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo.